Hey guys, and welcome to the Garage Athlete Show with myself and Daniel Fraser. We're on episode 41, I do believe. So, turning through We're not too far off a year, are we? No, we've um, we've been actually managed to be consistent for like a few weeks now. I think now the the twins are getting into a bit more of a routine and uh mate you're the uh, you're the second longest relationship i've ever had <laughs> fair enough I'll, I'll take that <laughs> um what i was gonna say yeah i'm in uh, in willow's room today because um the missus is working from home and my voice carries so yeah. uh yeah you just project it so well you see I don't know if you can see there's there's butterflies and uh and dragonflies on the wall very nice me, yeah so. I've, kind of, I've, I've currently got a four-year-old on the floor watching Gabby's Dollhouse. I don't know if nice. you've ever watched it. It's Good quite joy. a big show on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Dan has managed to get us a really cool guest for this week, uh, Mr. Adam Bishop, who I believe is Britain. Is he Britain currently Britain's strongest man? He is. Yeah, he's yeah. Britain's strongest man for 2020. So reigning Britain's British champion. He's also just received another invite to World Strongest Man. Uh, he was a former strength and conditioning coach at Harlequins FC, which is my former club. Uh, unfortunately, we missed each other while we were there. But he's recently just taken the decision to go full time with Strongman. So wow. if you sort of think he's already achieved British strongest man being part-time it's a pretty phenomenal effort so hopefully yeah, with him going full-time definitely. we can see some amazing things from him because he, he he does some seriously great performances at worlds and i think he's only just about my age like 32 so still young for the sport of strongman so yeah it would hopefully we're hopefully going to see some big finishes in from him here this season which would be fantastic we're going to pick his brains about all things strength all things uh you know uh, rugby conditioning i think we're going to talk yeah. to him we always like to hear about nutrition from the big guys and yeah, then we'll, uh, we'll crack on forward there we are just uh i'm just gonna get him on hopefully it pops up soon yeah just send the invite over so in, in the meantime like how i know you've uh you've <laughs> niggled your back a little bit haven't you yeah well do you know what? i did nick my back last week well remembered mate but touch wood uh, it's recovered very fast. Okay. Um, I put that down to walking, um, doing stopping all spinal loading, and then getting out and taking taking the painkillers and just doing as I should. And yesterday I squatted two forty for a single. Like nice. felt really nice. I think if I really wanted to go for it on that day, I would have had two sixty on me. So to yeah. go from you know, uh, what do you call it, being bedridden it was horrible mate like it was a big yeah. the problem when you get injuries and it's i don't know if you have any recurring injuries they get it's it's almost like from work i've done a cbt it's like a spiral so you get injured and suddenly your mind goes straight to all the times it's gone wrong how crap yeah. you're gonna feel this is rubbish it's all gonna go to shit so it was a big test mentally for me because it was a big of a doubt it was a big downer when i did it. i felt really like sad about this this is you know i felt really down in the dumps i felt like all this training had been for nothing but then um luckily it's replied quite quickly um it's got better quite quickly but i think adam is just logging in now so i think so here he is Ooh. how you doing guys you hear me all right yeah, yeah we're great how, how you doing adam i'm surviving mate i'm surviving we're nearly out of this <laughs> lockdown uh malarkey so yeah i know that, that's, that's, i think you, you are you down in surrey i am mate yeah oh god so, so, so yeah, where my parents down. live god's country right <laughs> yeah, what's yeah the it's, like? beautiful. it's beautiful mate yeah we're tucked away down in the corner here so uh Kind of just like looking out into the woods and that. It's uh, it's very, very nice. So we got it a lot better, you know. A lot of people in London are kind of been stuck to a one bedroom apartment for uh, the last couple of weeks. So the last couple of yeah. months. So, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, have have you found with because I think in lockdown, am I, am I right in saying you competed last year at Wells during quarantine? Yeah. Yeah. So we had uh, we actually had um, World's Choice Man was the end of November, uh, and then we had the Short Classic as well in December. We were of obviously course, allowed yeah. to travel. Uh, we, we got kind of travel exemptions to go and travel into the States and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, obviously I, I do all my training uh, in my own home gym. So I'm very, very fortunate we got that built when we moved in. So it was kind of, uh, yeah, good, good foresight, I guess. And yeah. very lucky that I've got that to continue my training. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been bizarre, you know, a lot of, lot of restrictions kind of on, you know, movement, especially like traveling, like going through airports at the moment is... It's great because there's no people, but it's obviously the uh, the delays trying to get every all the paperwork sorted to show you're allowed to travel, and obviously wearing the mask the whole time is not ideal, and you're a bit yeah. of an oxygen thief like me. 
it's, uh, yeah, it's, you don't go around with your CPAP on, maybe. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Luckily, I'm not. I'm not on the CPAP machine yet. Um, <laughs> I thought it was just a re- prerequisite for being a top level strongman. I know, I know. I'm avoiding it at the moment. Um, yeah, we'll try and stay away from that. But as the body, <laughs> as the body weight goes up, it's probably a, a risk that's it's going to take on. <laughs> yeah, is, is that something you're still keen to be progressing your body weight, or are you kind of happy with where you're at? No, it, it depends on the contest, really. Um, for a show like World Strongest Man, it, it does pay to be coming a bit heavier. Um, because it's a slower competition, you know, it, it takes place over a week. There's more time to recover between events. And obviously there's a couple of static events in there as well. And, you know, you're only doing a couple of events per day at best. So you can afford to be a bit heavier. Like, whereas, you know, Britain's Strongest Man last year was a one day show, five events done in three hours, uh, all quite quick moving. So probably you quite of, well then. Yeah, well, I just didn't want to put the. I, didn't, I, I was gaining weight at the time, and when I got the events through, I was like, "There's no point in being heavy for this comp." You know, mm. the body weight would have been detrimental um, just to, to the events I was having to do. But yeah, for this this one now at Worlds, obviously, I'm trying to push my body weight up. I'll hopefully pick up another couple of kilos before World Strongest Man in about eleven weeks' time. It's interesting what oh, you said weeks. there about how you've looked at the events and then decided right it's probably not going to be beneficial to come in just those little a couple of kilos heavier but then something like worlds where so i i don't really do strongman i'm more into like bodybuilding and aesthetics i didn't realize that the there's that level of thought that goes into it like ahead of time so like how far ahead from something like worlds or from british do you get the list of events that you're going to be doing uh it varies really um traditionally the Giants live shows like Britain's Strongest Man, Europe's Strongest Man, we get plenty of notice on events. You know, the, the events, uh, you know, Darren Sadler, the organizer will send out the events to the athletes well in advance, you know, eight, eight weeks uh, before. Um, World's Strongest Man uh, is notorious for changes, you know? Right. So we might get a list of possible events, but we don't know what group we're in, so we don't know what the, the finer details are. So you basically have to be ready for everything. And, you know, changes happen like, Last year, there was a hurricane, so we had to move inside. So obviously, there was no truck pull. Yes. Uh, we had to have like a, a, a farmer's walk instead. Uh, you know, the year before, um, it also depends on what kit they've got available. So, you know, the year before, we had a, they did a super yoke um, and they designed it and the tires just turned up in time. They put these massive tires on the, the, the super yoke. Obviously, people don't know what a super yoke is. It's where we carry a massive weight on our back for a distance. Um, and this super yoke uh, was supposed to be 500 kilos and they got the tires and the tires came in heavier than they were expecting. Uh, and then once they put that on the frame, they found out that he actually weighed 615 kilos. So it's quite a lot overweight. And just to get, give you an idea, like a standard super yoke now is around a thousand pounds, around 455. Yeah. So wow, you're talking geez. like well over 150 kilos heavier than we were expecting with no training. Uh, <laughs> heavy yoke, it was, uh, it was an interesting challenge for sure. Yeah, is is that heavier than the Arnold, or is that about the same? Uh, I think the the Arnold got to. I think the Arnold might have gone up to seven hundred. Um, <laughs> it's but just ridiculous. The Arnold, the Arnold did that, and it was like three meters, you know, so it was mm. really short. And the one at Worlds was actually after Farmer's Walk and another. Uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Fifty kilo yoke. So, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, a bit crazy. It, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's always such a. <sighs> I did, I've done a bit of strongman myself. I still do some strongman now. And it's funny when you talk to people, the first thing they say is, oh, what's strongest man? Like, if you, a lot of people still love it. And, you know, around Christmas time, it's all built around strongman still. It's still such a big part of um, Christmas, well, especially in my family, it was growing up. But it's, it's yeah. one of those things I kind of watching, I never knew. I, I didn't know it was an amateur thing. I didn't know you could sort of compete and get to there. I thought it was just, you know, like back in the old days, they picked the strongest people in the world and put them together. Um, but it's, it's been amazing to be in part of the sport and see how it all sort of correlates to each other so i'm going to be interesting could you sort of explain how you've come from i think i, I believe you're a winger maybe at the rugby and then you went from yeah. there progress all the way to you know competing at world's strongest man yeah so i mean I, I started off my rugby career playing the back row um and then um i was on the the, the books at saracens i was in the academy there and um you know it's, it's really weird right rugby clubs t- tend to produce loads and loads of 
good players in one position, depending on who's playing at the time. You know, I've always said this. So, like, yeah. at, at the time when I was going kind of through the academy, obviously, like, Richard Hill was still playing in the back row. We had, like, Dave Seymour, um, you know, obviously, yeah. like, Hugh Vivian playing, um, Ben uh, Skivington and stuff. Like, you know, it's... Um, uh, it was it was crazy the number of like good back rowers. So after halfway through the year, they actually decided to move me up to the wing. Um, you know, I played some I played some sevens. Obviously, I was, I was very quick for a back rower. Um, and probably ironically, I wasn't really big enough to be challenging in the back row at the time. I was kind of six foot three, but only about just under a hundred kilo, uh, oh, wow. which wasn't really that big compared to what some of the other guys were were kind of you know um, kind of walking around at. So you know played on the wing and uh, obviously things didn't work out at Saracens. In all honesty, looking back, I was in this position that I think a lot of academy players tend to be in now, obviously working with the senior guys, you know, that I was probably a really good athlete, uh, but probably just didn't have that set position on the rugby field. You know, I played back row, mm. played wing, uh, could have played centre. Do you know what I mean? It was just, I wasn't the best in that position, which is probably why I was more suited towards sevens. Um, yeah, but from there, took up my place at Loughborough University that I deferred uh, for a couple of years. And then, um, you know, it was just carried on my strength training, got stronger. Um, and then one day, uh, one of my uh, the guys I trained at the gym said, I'm going to go down and do some strongman training. Um, do you want to come and have a go? And it's so, like you said, you know, it's obviously the Christmas tradition. So I'd watched the uh, World's Strongest Man as a kid growing up and always wanted to have a go at doing some strongman stuff. So, you know, one Saturday afternoon, we went down to this like dusty yard in uh, <laughs> Leicestershire trained on some homemade kit. Everything was kind of like welded together. That's it. Um, and it competitions was- Competitions uh, in car parks, yeah. Competition in car parks. Honestly, my first comp was, yeah, in a, in a car park. I was still playing rugby at the time. We just kind of was on a Sunday. I think I played on a Saturday and then competed. On a Saturday. <laughs> Jeez. And um, yeah, it went really well. Obviously won, won that competition, which was in the 105 class. So people don't know, there are a couple of classes in, in Strongman. Um, at the time when I was coming through, there was only the open class the under 105 kilo class and then the 90 kilo class. Mm. Obviously now it's really stepped up. There's loads, loads more options, but uh, I could be in the under 105 class for kind of two years and then, yeah, moved up to the opens and, and steadily progressed through that. Um, yeah. and that's, it was probably after, after my first year at 105, that's when I kind of stopped playing rugby because then I noticed that um, I wanted my career to move more into strength conditioning because um, yes. it tied in a lot better with me competing. Uh, so obviously, be a strength and conditioning coach, especially at a rugby club, you can't be also playing rugby yourself. It just doesn't happen. Oh, God, no. uh, you're basically playing as it is, all the, all the travelling, right? Exactly. You travel with the, t- with the team, you work on their schedule. It's always Saturdays. Um, so that was when I kind of thought, well, strongman would be a really good good option for me. It allows me to still be competitive um, and, uh, yeah, still, still kind of um, train and get stronger and stuff, but also tighten with my job. Fantastic. So I just remember a point you made earlier about one club being loads of positions um, producing them. I just said, uh, just before I, I basically I was at Quinn's um, when you were just uh, before you came in. I think I yeah, missed yeah. you by maybe one or two seasons, but you talk about players. I mean, I was around, I was approaching that academy as getting into the senior squad. So it was kind of time for me to either play or move. And I wasn't playing, so I had to move. But players coming through, we had Will Collier. Carl yeah. Sinclair, yeah. Joe Marler, and I think they're all capped. So you can kind of see how you've got a player, you've got a move. So, you know, they actually did me great, but it's um, this is a phenomenal, it's just funny how certain clubs produce certain things at certain times. Yeah, I mean, I remember when obviously, like, when if you remember back to when Johnny Wilkinson was at, uh, um, at Newcastle, Wilkinson. they always yeah. they always seem to produce a load of fly halves behind him. I think it might just yeah. be a, a case of what kids are looking up to. I've got yeah. no doubt now with Martha Smith or Harlequins, we'll probably be producing a lot more kind of young tens in mm. the future at Harlequins in the same way, obviously when, you know, Chris Robshaw was at the helm, we produced a lot of back rowers, people kind of like Jack Clifford yeah. through and James Chisholm, et cetera. You know, those, those players are, are kind yeah, of following the, uh, following the example set by the, the seniors. Yeah. So how does it work when you're competing with Quinns uh, when you were there? Like how, how did that work? Cause obviously you have to go away. If you do worlds, you can't play at the weekend. Were they just quite understanding or did you have an agreement or? I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, uh, thank them all for being more supportive. You know, they were unbelievable. Um, it helped that the players loved it as well. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I worked under Connor, um, JK and obviously Paul Gustard and all three of them took an interest in, in what I was doing. Um, JK used to take the piss a bit more than the other two, but that was just JK. Um, but, uh, 
you know, it was it, they used to kind of give me the time off. So obviously, if I've got a competition one weekend, I'd have one of the other guys cover me for the game. Um, and the, the big one, obviously, with the COVID, because obviously I was working with Quinns up until mm-hmm. the middle of February. Um, with the COVID situation, they were exceptional because I had to travel away to compete and then I had to quarantine. So suddenly a week out for World's Strongest Man became three weeks uh, and the club supported me through that um, and allowed me the time off for that, which was, which was pretty special. Um, but yeah, you couldn't, couldn't think of a better employer really from a, from a competing and training point of view. So that must have been a really tough decision for you to go full time then. Mm, yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, financially, um, I was actually stable with Strongman. Um, you know, I was, I was actually earning more from Strongman than I was from Harlequin because of the salary reductions in the last year. Um, in, in terms of Strongman, how does the, just for people listening, like how does the revenue income work? Like, I know you, there's prize money. But I mean, how does it, you get paid being a Strongman? Yeah, there's, there's prize money for each competition you do. Uh, sometimes there's an appearance fee as well. That's very rare. So most of the time you're going out and you've got to be good. Uh, and if you, if it was, if it was just on um, winnings, then it'd be a different story, you know, because you can't guarantee that income. But a lot of us now get sponsors. Uh, with with Strongman growing uh, as much as it is in this country, we've got various sponsors. You know, I, I work with, with a couple of a couple of different sponsors from SBD, which is a uh, uh, lifting apparel, you know, belts, wrist straps, etc. Yeah, yeah. uh, company. Comes, yeah. To uh, Silverback Clothing, I work with those guys, uh, Silverback Gymwear, uh, and those guys obviously support me in all I do, um, and you know that that money obviously allows me to then train full time. Oh, brilliant! So it kind of was a nice progression going from you know SNC competing to going full time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the only thing I've got is like looking trying to explain your income to someone is a bit weird, you know, where you say like one month you might be earning X amount. And then the yeah. following month you get paid for a competition and then suddenly it's like so much more. But then you can't you can't plan for that. You can't just go out and spend yeah. that money because suddenly oh, of course not, yeah. next three months you might not have any competitions, you know? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a bizarre, like, a bizarre way to make money. <laughs> it's kind of like that. You know that Sunny in Philadelphia meeting with Charlie when he's got his hand on the board trying to explain it all. That's it, um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> I guess it's self-employed life though, hey man? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so in terms of now you are... Full time strong man. Uh, what's changed? Are you are you trading more? Are you trading less? Are you just putting more effort into recovery? Are you doing things differently, or has um, has it changed? Yeah, pretty much all of the above actually. Um, so going full time has allowed me, you know, a lot more opportunities I had that I didn't obviously when I was working. Um, like for in terms of if we start with training, I'm now training twice a day, uh, four days a week. So I'll do seven sessions one day, I train once. Um, I do seven sessions in four days, which allows me more time to rest and recover. Um, but also those sessions are split up. So whereas I used to have to cram it all into one session um, and it would take ages, now I can split up, get some rest in between. Just like if you imagine a, a professional rugby player would go and do his weight training and then he'd uh, have a rest, do some physio work, eat, and then do his rugby session in the afternoon. That's the same thing I've applied with me. You know, I'll go and do my gym work in the morning I'll rest, eat, and then I'll be focused on my strongman events in the afternoon uh, or doing some additional gym work, depending on where I am at in the season, you know. And that was, uh, that's was that been huge for me, the fact that, you know, from a training point of view, I've got these, these shorter kind of focus sessions um, is, is making a huge difference. Um, and then, you know, from a food point of view, which is, I always describe myself as like a professional eater and a part-time strongman. Uh, it's just the biggest part of the game, you know, getting the food down your neck. Um, you know, I, I'm able to cook all my my meals fresh. Um, I'm never missing meals. You know, whereas when I was at work, obviously you can be on your feet for quite a long time. You've got gym sessions, you've got uh, rugby sessions to look after. You've got you know, you've got kind of 25 to 50 players to, to worry about. Um, whereas now I'm I'm able just to you know get up, cook my breakfast, a couple of hours later, come back, cook my lunch fresh. There's no more Tupperwares. There's no more. Uh, taking multiple uh, weight gainer shakes with me to work, etc. I used to carry a massive cool box to work with all my food in. Uh, but, you know, it's just uh, it's, a, it's a lot more focused towards me being a professional athlete in the same way that you can think back of a, like a rugby player going from part-time to full-time. You just have more time to do the little bits that make you so much better, you know, making sure you've got your nutrition on point. You're recovering in between those sessions as much as possible. Uh, and you make sure you're getting the most out of all your, your training time. 
So I've got to ask, I think everyone's going to be interested. What's a, what's a typical day's eating like for a strong man? I mean, what are, what are you weighing? What's, what are the portion sizes like? Everyone loves this part. Yeah, so at, at the moment, I'm 154 kilos. Um, and uh, I'll be trying to get up to about 160. It, for, for anyone that's watching this, uh, Adam has pretty much taken up the whole screen with his <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling very small at the moment. I know, it's, it's, it's mainly like face, face and ass weight right now, so it is taking up the screen. <laughs> Um, Just, no, like you know, I'm I'm, I'm I'm at that weight at the moment. Um, it's taken a long time to get up to that weight, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's starting to move now that I'm obviously not moving as much, which is a big thing as well. Uh, but yeah, my food wise at the moment, uh, so right now I'm on uh, six and a half thousand calories, and I'm going to ramp that up over the next kind of eleven weeks to you know when I'm in the last four weeks at Wells, when my training's at its peak, I'll be on eight and a half thousand calories um, as I try and kind of try not to lose weight and, and to be carved up and because obviously I'll be a lot heavier by the time we get to the, uh, just before World's Strongest Man. So I'll need the extra the fuel. Is it, is it not a struggle? Oh yeah. 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 So Jeez. my last, my last meal, I'm just kind of sitting there and sometimes I'll be there. And <laughs> like my Mrs. Amy, she's a, she's a triathlete and she'll, she'll have finished her food. She's clearing up. and I'm just sitting there trying to shovel, shovel okay. some uh, ribeye steak and rice down my neck and, it's uh yeah it's it's a it's a weird one you know but the more i can try and the more food i can get into me earlier in the day it kind of offsets uh my basal metabolic rate which is crazy like we, we got my basal metabolic rate so for anyone know that's that's the amount of calories you burn if you're sitting completely still if you lie completely still all day this is the, the amount of calories your body will just burn anyway and mine's 2803 um so i have to eat that just to offset how many calories I'll burn just being still. And then I've got to eat to then cover the uh, calories I'll be burning from moving and training. And then I have to have some more on top of that to then obviously when I'm trying to push my body weight up, you know, you need more calories in if you want to be, be heavier and build muscle, etc. So yeah, it is a, it's a big old struggle trying to get the food down, down my neck. And it's, that's why how I obviously, much, go on, mate, no, go on. How much of that food is like clean? So, like, your good quality, like, lean proteins, like rice, oats, and do you throw any calorie-dense stuff in there, or is it literally just all clean food? I, I'd describe it pretty much all clean food, apart from Thursday. So, Thurs, Thursday's my day where I, it's my cheat day, and whereas most kind of body was might have a cheat meal, I'll have a cheat day because I'm just trying to eat as many calories as possible. So, I'll go yeah. out and it'll be a bit of a challenge for me. Uh, that's because my event, my event training day and deadlift days on the Friday, so I want to be carved up for that. Ah, so you've timed it for the, the big it, yeah. the And I've also timed it for a day off. So my Thursday's a day off because, uh, you know, as anyone knows, if you go on a proper binge eating session, you just feel like shit the whole time. So you, know, you, just gotta, <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't want to have to move or anything like that. So, yeah, so my, my daily diet's pretty basic. You know, I'll have, um, morning I'll have like oats, uh, egg whites. I'll have like 10 egg whites. Uh, two cups of oats, a uh, scoop of whey protein, and like 400 mils of whole milk. Blend that up, and that's mine. Uh, then I'll have a weight gainer shake in the middle of the day, uh, which is all carb and, and protein based. Uh, at the moment, I'm adding two bagels in around those two meals at some point uh, with some uh, peanut butter and some uh, jam as well. Uh, then I'll have two meals during the day, which is either ribeye steak or, or chicken thighs. Um, and some rice or potatoes. And then finally, I'll just finish up with another uh, weight gainer shake in the evening after my second session and mm. a, uh, another protein, oats, and uh, egg whites uh, shake in the evening. So, yeah, blending a lot of food makes it a lot easier to, to get it in, uh, but it's all yeah. kind of still like real food as I describe it. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's just it's an onslaught. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's taken some. I'm just, I'm just trying to get my head around it. Taking some graft. If you competed at hundred, like, you know, you say you're at hundred k when you're at Sarah's, you competed at one hundred five to jump up to you know one hundred fifty. That's obviously it's a lot of time, dedication, and training. But that's a lot of, you know, one percent added up. I know Brian Shaw talks about it in sports psych. Like they talk about it all the time all these one yeah. percent. So it sounds like it's a, you know, there's that consistency day in day out to get to where that level you're at now. But I mean, where do you, where do you feel? you are currently i mean obviously we'll talk i hope to talk a bit more about you know reigning britain's strongest man i think you're so 32 only um just gone full time i mean where do you feel personally within yourself of where you are do you think you're nearing your peak or do you think you've got much more to give i think i've got so much more to give you know just the the, the differences i'm seeing from my training now 
um, it is quite startling, really, how much my body weight is able to pop up a bit more and, and how my, much my lifts are just feeling a lot easier. Um, mm. so I think I've got a lot, a lot more to give. And the great thing about strongman is, you know, it's not like rugby where, you know, the body will just fall apart for all the, the uh, contacts. Mm. And you've got a certain, you know, a lot of guys start young and then they finish. Most of us with strongman, we start a little bit later. Um, so I started obviously when I was 21, which is still quite young, really, for it. But it's more a case of how many years you can withstand the heavy loads with strongman. So you'll hear, hear most of the guys in strongman will kind of peak in their late 30s. Um, you know, guys like Big Z and Brian probably said they're at their strongest in their late 30s. So I've got plenty of time. And, and you know, for all of us, you know, we're, we're all... If, if there's a strongman out there who says he doesn't want to be world's strongest man, then he's lying. You know, everyone wants to be... Everyone wants to be world's strongest man. It's the ultimate title. It's like being the fastest man on the planet, you know, or the fittest or whatever. Um, yeah, everyone wants to be world's strongest man. And, and that's the goal for me, really. And, and that's uh, obviously why I've gone full time of it and, and why it <laughs> ruins the rest of my life, you know, because I think, uh, it, like, obviously, if I draw a graph of like, like being good at strongman, how I've got better at strongman, I've just got worse as a human being, like, in all general, general serious, you know, like. <laughs> I'm over 300 pounds all year round. It's not good. Like, you know, trying to be this kind of big and like trying to fit into cars and, and, uh, and move around and not break seats. That's the usual one. Don't want to break toilets. That's another one with strong men. That's a problem. Uh, yeah. Is that because of the safe. food or just the size? The <laughs> a bit of both. A bit of both. Um, but yeah, like I've, I've broke multiple toilet seats. Uh, I've broke multiple chairs. Uh, just kind of sitting on them too too heavy. Um, yeah. Have you ever had a chair break at a stadium uh, when you're pitch side? No, I haven't. And that, thank God. Uh, yeah, I haven't had that, which was, yeah. I've, I've, luckily, that's never happened to me because that would be embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've had it happen in a restaurant. I've had it happen at home um, where I literally went arse over tit where I broke this uh, Ikea chair in half. Um, <laughs> and then I went, I went back and stayed with my parents and I broke the bed. Um, like I went through the middle of the bed, uh, so yeah, it's, it's occupational hazard being this heavy, you know, it's got some serious, yeah, issues. just a bit. I think you make an interesting point there about how, as the level in your sport has increased, like the level of being able to just be a normal human can decreases. I think a lot of people don't understand the level of sacrifice that goes into being like a high level athlete in any sport, like you can't go out on the lash at a weekend yeah. you can't just eat what you want when you want like trying to eat like people think dieting is hard trying to eat four five six thousand calories a day it takes a lot of time and effort and planning ahead of time so a lot of people want the results but they don't realize like the level of dedication it takes to get to like that certain level um and then when they actually actually listen to somebody like yourself who is at that level and realize no this completely takes over your life i think some people then should like reconsider what their own goals are then with their fitness yeah i mean my like i said my whole life is dominated by strongman um i don't go out um lockdown for me has been not that big of a change in all honesty you know um you know i don't i don't go out i don't drink when i'm training for competition uh so i'll drop drinking from about 12 weeks out i'll move on to like alcohol free beer um it's never the same, but at least I found a good one at the moment, which is tasting all right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm always thinking, so if, if we go out anywhere, if we want to go out for the day, I have to plan ahead, right? I need to be back training at this time. I need to have this many meals when I'm out. I have to take them with me. And it, honestly, it gets, I get quite stressed about it. If, um, if I'm missing meals, if I'm missing, if I'm late for training or anything like that, I do get really stressed about it. So it's, it's not healthy. Like, definitely not healthy being that obsessed with something. Um, but I, you know, I think you're right. Most kind of top level elite athletes are incredibly selfish, like myself. I'm incredibly selfish, and I'm just focused on on me the vast majority of the time. And I think you have to be, especially if in an individual sport like uh, like strongman, you know, like any kind of athletics, etc. It's it's kind of you have to really, really uh, subject the others around you to some hardships and honesty. Uh, but it's it's all towards that kind of one common goal. So what yeah, sort of support a... network have you got around you? You're obviously, you've mentioned your partner as well. So it sounds like she helps and support and is quite supportive of this kind of like dream that you've got. So like, 
how long have you guys been together and have you had relationships in the past that have suffered because of this or has she been there like since you started yeah so um I've, I've been i've been with amy for nine years so obviously that's pretty much the whole of the strongman time uh you know she's a lucky girl when we met i was 105 kilos now i'm 154 so that's a great that's a great uh return for our money investment. you know <laughs> uh, great investment who wouldn't who wouldn't want that uh, so much more man to love uh, but uh, oh, Christ, uh amy, amy, amy's great she's uh she's a triathlete herself she does iron man so she knows what it wow. takes um have you ever gone for a run together god no no <laughs> i would love to see that's, that's like asking if amy's ever pulled a truck you know it doesn't happen <laughs> actually but amy, funny story amy's um uh, well, was a member of this running club and there was loads of like the, the guys there and we used to chat at parties and stuff and they would come up with this like event which was crossover between strongman and and running which would be like we'd like run a 5k and then pick up an atlas stone and i was like don't i'll win that easy and like, what do you mean i was like well i'll just walk 5k and by the time we get to the end you're still you still can't pick up the atlas stone because you're like 60 <laughs> kilos wet through so you know, it's not going to be a competition you know um but yeah it's, amazing. it's fortunate like, we always say like but both myself and amy are quite kind of selfish people and, and we you know we like we like what we like and um, Amy's into her, her career and she's into her uh, triathlon, which is great. And it allows me just to focus on on my stuff as well. I don't have to worry about about you know entertaining her or anything like that. You know, it's uh, yeah, both got, you know. got our own individual um, individual things, individual interests, and I think that's why our relationship is so strong because we do have things that we don't don't do together all the time. You know what I mean? We've both got our own space, and I think that's probably what people are you know, especially during lockdown people are kind of struggling with sometimes being in each other's pockets the whole time and uh people do need that individual space as well yeah absolutely i think you've you've absolutely nailed on that i mean when i was playing all of that you were describing is exactly that like i moved my wife to newcastle from sorry because i was like and yeah. I, it wouldn't even come into my mind like why wouldn't you come like it wasn't yeah. even a question but of course you know you got to think a lot of these players strong they're moving around all the country and everyone just falls in line with it but it's when you come out and you realize oh it's not all about me now i, I really struggled with that for the first few years even now a little bit like um, i do after i do bnsf and i've gone to the the natties in hungary and i do some british powerlifting that kind of stuff but it's still very, you know, it's amateur, but I'm still like, I've got to train at this time. I've got to do this. It's yeah. like, Dan, you've got three kids to take care of. Oh, oh yeah, crap. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all on the back burner. So it's, it's, it's interesting you saying that. I mean, and Don as well, he's a bodybuilder. So you can imagine when it comes to comp day, it must be tough for his fiance, right? I mean, like weighing out, you know, fish and all this kind of stuff. Fish and a rice cake. He's just having fish and a rice cake. That's <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, he described his diet once and it was pretty much fish and a rice cake. Fish and a, fish and a rice cake and some broccoli. That's all the bodybuilders eat. Um, yeah, that's sort of that. A bit of porridge every now and again. Yeah, oh, if yeah. you're lucky, if you're lucky, get some carbs. <laughs> yeah, you got a liquor. Was it Paul used to say a liquor of a dried prune? Yeah, that's, <laughs> it. that's it. But yeah, I mean, man. look, you, you kind of definitely run home there. I think people, especially with professional rugby players working with those guys, everyone thinks it's great. You know, they're paid you know thousands, thousands of pounds to do what they love. But then, like you said, you know, you're on two year contracts. Imagine, and we were the same in SC, obviously as well. You know, yeah. in terms of job security, it's it's a nightmare. If you if you told a member of the public, right, you've got this job for two years, but at some point you might get injured and you won't be able to work. Uh, and also then you might lose that job at any point. And at some point you're going to have to move across the country because there's only a certain number of places that you can do your job. Uh, and then obviously you've got the, you know, buying a house. I think people don't realize the problems that guys have when that you're on those kind of fixed term contracts. Like, most of these guys have to get really short mortgages. They're on like eight year mortgages because they have to pay the house off before their career ends. Um, mm. You know, it, it, it's, it's not the same as football where they're paid millions and millions of pounds. It, because of the salary cap, you know, they have to have to make their money while they can, but it's not a job for life rugby. It's not like kind of football, oh, no, live off the no, money. No, you know, people, people need to understand that, that how much, you know, how much rugby players are sacrificing and, and putting their bodies on the line um, you know, and they should be supported massively because because they're not getting the same money that that obviously the, the footballers are. Yeah, I mean, speaking of that, from an S and C, we've had we've had um, um, Don's friend who's a S and C coach. Uh, is it Everton ladies? Yeah, Everton ladies. Yeah, it was very much saying his job in S to C was kind of more 
injury prevention, like not letting the girls get hurt. I mean, is it still the same sort of? If, I mean, I had some, I and I trained with Gaz when I was at Quinns and Damsey, yeah. and I had the, you know, great coaches, very big on getting big and strong. But it was very clear the senior players were very, at the time, I didn't quite understand it. I thought they were quite, quite lazy. They just couldn't be bothered, but they were very, I'd almost say body aware, like not to push things or not really worried so much. I mean, from an SNC point of view, how do you manage getting guys as strong as humanly possible, but not hurting them and knowing yeah. when to push, pull back? And, you know, what technology do you use now to help the guys? Yeah, well, in terms of technology, we're not using as much. And, and I, I personally am not a big fan of technology. I feel like when you use technology, you end up just staring at a screen as opposed to looking at the athlete. So I, I was big on having relationships with all the athletes. I get to know how they lift. So how, trust. Yeah, trust. So I know when I was working with Marla, I know what 100 kilo on a back squat should look like for him. And I know what 140 and what 180 looks like and then a 200. And that's where I can judge how he's doing physically. You know, mm. if, if he comes in and suddenly 140 is looking like a bag of shit and he's moving the bar really slowly, then we know, right, we need to back off this guy and talk to the athlete, you know, see how they're feeling. Like, I think, like I said, a lot of, a lot of s and now is, that's the biggest problem I've found is a lot of the s coaches coming up are so blinded by technology and they're wanting to use their gym awares, they want to use like, Amiga Wave, they want to use uh, everything, they look at heart rate variability and all that and, and force plates, etc. But there's a lot to be said about just traditional coaching and getting to know an athlete and, and working with them that way. And, you know, and with rugby players, especially it's not like an nfl player you can't have a strength block for a huge amount of time and then just leave them to do their own thing the season is so long i mean they can play 33 games um yeah, we, have to, we have to be trying to get trying to get these little strength increases throughout the whole year you know we have to we have to try and move them forward because we have five weeks off season where we just want them to rest because they're absolutely annihilated and then we'll have a, a pre-season where the 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 focus, yes, we're going to have to try and get them strong, but the focus has to be to get them running fit because the game is a running-based game. Um, and, and that's the unique challenge that rugby prevent, uh, presents. It's the fact that you have to, like you said, know when to push them, know when to, to say, pull them back, and even say, look, I know you're feeling great and you want to go for that kind of big squat, but let's just hold back. Think we've got a game on Friday and then we've got a long week, week after. Let's go for it then. You know, and, and 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 no to try and tell a player even though they're feeling great no no just 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 hold back a little bit is is hugely important absolutely i mean um what kind of i always i always love asking this what kind of numbers are the guys shifting these days i mean back when i was playing if someone scored 200 ish that was considered massive i mean if the standards change yeah i mean we've got a lot of I, well, that was that was my thing when i took over working with forwards i wanted to get a certain number of 200 kilo squatters just at the baseline and the vast majority of our guys that are over 200 kilo in the type five now. Um, you know, we've got guys like Simon Kerrod, uh, be around the 260 mark on the squat. Uh, Wilco Lowe won't be far off. Marla's around the 240, 250 mark. Is, is this all beltless sleeveless? No, no. So it, I, I allow them to use belts. Yeah. Um, I, I've managed to secure like about five or six belts from SBD as one of the bonuses. Of the <laughs> there. Bad. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not this whole beltless to train your core right a prop has got his core his core is being trained in the scrum that's his his specific movement you know and that's how he's going to get better at scrummaging uh not by doing a beltless squat where we're increasing risk you know in the gym we're trying to reduce as much risk as possible because there's enough risk out on the on the training field so i used this i used i used the squat um as a, a way of overloading their their body so we we use it as a uh, get them to handle heavy, heavy loads on their spine to prepare them for the scrum. Yeah, yeah. Also, from a neural neural point of view, we're trying to get that kind of large, large load on to, to elicit a, an adaptation. Um, you know, in this case, getting stronger. Um, and that's what I, I used it for. I didn't see the point of training it beltless. If the guys wanted to wear a belt, I let them wear a belt. Um, I don't think a belt suddenly makes your core sloppy. Uh, yeah. it, you have to really work hard you, you have to work hard in your abdominals to actually push out against that belt yeah so you know for, for me the whole like beltless training your core is is short-sighted really because surely you want to train for longevity you know yeah yeah i mean there's like, the argument potentially you don't wear a belt on the pitch so should you wear one in the gym i mean what, what yeah. would you say to that I'd, I'd say you also don't squat on the on the pitch if yeah, you do, you're get sat down um, you, don't, you don't walking lunge, you don't bench press, you don't military press with a barbell. 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's more of a case of, like I said, we, when we do all this scrum work and this scrum core work, it's always done as close to competitive exercise as possible. And don't get me wrong. I understand that these guys are rugby players. So, mm. you know, I, I want to get them better at scrummaging. My goal is not to make them better at squatting. My goal mm. is to make them better at scrummaging. And if that means they can squat more, then brilliant. Uh, but if it means I need to select a different exercise to get them better at scrummaging, then I'll do that. Oh. Without, whenever my squat got stronger, my scrummaging got better. It was almost like it was stupid how in line it was. Um, yeah. it, it just to the point now, like you know, when I was doing husband, I think I could squat like one ninety with that equipment, or maybe. I mean, I'm now my best has been two, was it two seventy, two eighty odd. So I'm kind of like, oh fuck, I would just I'd love to get in a scrum and see how that feels. Um, yeah. But uh, well, my well, back's this, 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 yeah. this is what I found quite interesting actually with the uh, with the squat. Um, it, it, like you said, I think with, with players, it is a certain, there is a certain kind of diminishing returns, if you like. And, and uh, where, you know, you could be chasing time with an elite player trying to put five kilos on his squat. But with the squats at an uh, acceptable level, you're actually getting better at scrummaging through different means. 100%, mm. like you've got a stronger athlete, but that's, it's not going to be the, the same way the old time. You know, there's, there's people who squat loads who would be dog shit in a scrum. Uh, had plenty yeah. around you, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think definitely like you do see. Obviously, your stronger squatters are usually your better scrummagers. Um, but if you take Marla for example, am I am I really going to make him better at scrummaging oh. by gaining two and a half to five kilos on his squat, no. or is it going to be more from his uh, practice of that that technical movement, one on ones, overloading that scrum position, but with, with two two on ones or three on ones, and him holding that weight? Pro- probably the latter, I think. Uh, the more yeah. you can put him in the competitive exercise, in my opinion, the better. <laughs> my friend described um, playing with me with another friend in the academy, just put his arm around and was like, what the fuck is that? Because his erectors are like fucking huge. Ridiculous. They're ridiculous. It's right probably there. the thickest I've come across. You're just like, you're just born that way, I think, some of these guys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, definitely, definitely. I mean, Marla, he works extremely hard. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. He works extremely hard and he puts a lot of time in the gym um, to, to get stronger. I mean, guys like Sink, for example, like genetic freaks, like he, he, he'd walk in and hit huge numbers on the bench press easy. Uh, oh, he'd, rip, made for it. he'd rip the barbell off the floor with bad form on the deadlift and still be strong. Uh, whereas a guy like Marla, I think, has, has done, don't get me wrong, he's obviously still genetically gifted for, mm-hmm. for strength, but he, mm-hmm. he tended to put a lot more hours in um, on his training to, to get to where he was. Yeah, I remember um, my academy coach, six, uh he says, oh, I've got this. Did we know when Colin Osborne was there? Of course it was, yeah. I was there with Osborne. Yeah, Colin, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's kind of posh, poshest man I've ever come across. But he was yeah, talking, I remember him talking about Sinclair years and years ago. Like, oh, well, my, well, like, mark my words, I've got this like 14, 15 year old kid. He's already back scoring like 160. I was like clean. I was just like, okay. And then lo and behold, the next few years, like, I remember it's, some people just wired uh, to be strong. I, I was there. Guys. I was there. My first year was when Sink came into the academy and he was. He was yeah. fat as fuck. Like, he, 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 <laughs> we chat about this, the fact that I saw him running around the field and he was just waddling. He was so slow. Because, you know, he did the usual thing with academy players where he was like, I've got to be big, I've got to be heavy. Um, yeah. Because you, know, you wanted to play first team straight away. And then he was just, yeah, horrendously out of shape. And then over the next few years, he worked with the academy coach and, and came into the senior squad and, and got a lot fitter. Um, and then, yeah, now... Obviously, he's doing great things on the international scene and stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, he, he's looking a more kind of more rounded player. Oh, God. Phenomenal player. Yeah. On his, on his day, you know, the carries, he does everything. I think we suffered a lot in the World Cup when he didn't play, I think. Like, um, and, you know, Cole came on. He's still a, you know, incredible player himself. But I, I do think we suffered a lot when Sinclair came up, just to show from a tight head how important his contribution to the game was. And that, yeah. So, obviously, credit to you, the work you do with him. So, thinking of that, is it, is it easier to get fat guys, strong guys, pitch fit than it is thinner guys who are maybe a fit stronger? Or is it about the same? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's completely individual. So if a guy is, so for example, if a guy is uh, thin, lacking muscle mass, you can and obviously already really fit. It's probably a reason, you know, he's already genetically predetermined to be that way. So trying to fight his genetics effectively and put muscle mass on him is very difficult in the same way as if you've got a really strong guy who's cardiovascularly very very poor um it's always going to be tough to they drop them down so i don't think they're i think they're two different things you know um it's, it's whatever you're genetically strong at um 
But yeah, I mean, there's, you hear obviously the usual like fat clubs back in the uh, pro <laughs> lifetime season. membership, mate. Lifetime <laughs> membership. <laughs> I was there every season, mate. The morning <laughs> seven a.m. sessions, you know. Uh, uh, mate, I've still got shudders from it. Fucking up running up hills in Richmond, it was awful, man. <sighs> But I think I think a lot of, a lot of clubs, and I still do this, put too much emphasis on skin folds. Like they they, they say skin folds, body fat percentage. For people who don't know, you know, once you got the calipers to get measured out, and yeah, you bring the calipers out, and guys are suddenly uh, really nervous. Um, I think I personally think they put too much effort on that. You know, these are rugby players. You should look look at them objectively and go, is he fit enough to play the game? I don't care what he looks like. You know, I don't care if he he looks fat. If he's fit enough to play the game. Then, then great, that extra bulk is going to help him in the long run. Um, yes, if a player is both unfit and fat, then yeah, I'll look at his body composition and go, okay, he probably needs to get leaner. But this this holy grail crest for leaner, leaner athletic bodies is is it's actually hurting rugby players, in my opinion, because you know they, they try and focus on that when they should be focused on being better at rugby. Oh, it, it's really... Nice to hear that because I think back when I was younger at Queens, it did feel there was that big push on skin folds on body fat to the point, you know, we're talking professional rugby. Man, I was on like a hundred grams or less of carbs today because I was obsessed with I have to drop fat. And it's it's it, it, it actually seems bonkers um when I look back on what, what I was doing. And then right. I mean luckily the Falcons were a bit more they didn't care so much. They were like as long as you feel all right and you can play, you can play. But um yeah, it's it's interesting you say that. And I think even now with uh, mentally, it's it's hard as well. You do get you, you, it's funny you mention the uh, when they say the skin folds coming out, you'll see guys you know standing cold runs, do like all this kind of stuff, like try and get their skin feeling really tight. But when they get them stretched, like oh, don't just do it like this, just touch this. But it really does give some anxiety with skin folds. One hundred percent. Unfortunately, it's still around. There are certain certain high ranking coaches at international setups that wear a red rose on their chest who are still obsessed with skin fold. They're still obsessed with how how much how lean. I get it. I do get it because it's measurable, you know. Mm-hmm. So you can. It's the problem with like how do you measure if a player is better at rugby? You know how like actually playing the game. Is it more yeah. tries? Is it? Do you know what I mean? And it, they try and break it down so much, and that's why um, a lot of rugby players, rugby coaches, sorry, are obsessed with physical markers because we can give them data and say, look, his squat has gone up by X amount or he is now 5% stronger. And you show progression, and there's this massive push for always progressing, always progressing. And it's the same with skin folds, you know? Like, it's it's measurable. So you can give people goals. Like, if I came to you and said, I just want you to get better at scrummaging, then how, how do we measure that, really? You know, you know, successful scrums, but it's not just you. Obviously, there's eight guys around you or whatever, or seven guys around you. I always play, then, if it goes wrong anyway. Exactly. And if, it, if, it's, <laughs> if, it's, um, if it's, you know skin folds it's completely on that individual and they have to work towards it so i do understand why they use it but i just think it's quite short-sighted personally and what do you think from that from a bodybuilder point of view though um i think i kind of like uh, adam saying i kind of under yeah i kind of understand it um the theory behind it is obviously if you're leaner you're going to be lighter like the thick body fat with it not being contractile tissue is going to essentially weigh you down but i i'm more inclined to agree with adam like there's going to be certain guys that genetically are going to want to hold on to a little bit more body fat which means they're going to be a little bit heavier and in the scrum that might having that little bit of extra weight might actually help and if it's more like a back that needs to be faster or things like that then being a little bit leaner would probably help but I don't think it should be the be all and end all. And as you've said, it's, it's just getting something to measure. It needs to be something quantifiable. Like people need to justify the decisions that they're making with putting numbers behind it. And like a good coach should have that data there, but know when to use it and when not to use it. And that can be the same whether it's in changing somebody's body competition, like some some people come to me as a coach and they want to get, they say they want to get leaner, but you actually go into the ins and outs of dropping body fat and they really, really struggle with it because they struggle with the tracking, they struggle with um, the workouts, they struggle with the amount of focus on numbers when actually if you take a step back, take the numbers out of the equation and get them to start focusing on their habits, 
they then lose the weight without having to kind of do the tracking. So I think it, it's a similar sort of situation. Some people get blinded by the data rather than the result that they want to get and utilizing different methodology to get there. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. And the, the, the analogy I always use is if, if you've got a, a coach who's obsessed with it, I was like, well, drop the players who are over a certain percentage of body fat. Do that. And then we'll see how we get on. You know, for, take Alex Dombrand, for example, um, you know, fantastic player. You want to drop a high scoring player like, like Dombers because he, his skin folds used to be, not anymore, used to be uh, over, over the limits of what you think is acceptable. Of course you're not. You need to win games. You need to score tries. So, you know, it, it's you have to definitely look at that data and 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 make wise decisions from it. You know, you can't just be because also if you're always on at a player, like if you're always on saying you're too fat, you're too fat. That's gonna get in the head. And then when it comes to game day, suddenly you, you're not creating a, a confident player. You, you're putting this doubt in his head the whole time. You know, it's not it's not healthy. Yeah, no, it's definitely not. I mean. Yeah, you're accurate, loads of stuff I remember very clearly from my playing days. I mean, looking back at last year, it was, I'm just looking at it now, it was a hell of a year for you, man. Why was mm. it? We had win, one Britain, second at Europe, and then sixth for Worlds. That's that's incredible. I mean, what's it like going from, that's, that's phenomenal, going from that to like, you know, this weird quarantine world where everything's changed you know you're a bit up i think they are still doing prints i think now but everything's a bit up in the air at the moment it must be quite frustrating it looked like you build loads of momentum i know the silver dollar dead was also through the roof as well so it's kind of like how do you maintain that kind of momentum going from that incredible year to going into 2021 uh i guess it's just kind of i focused on what went well last year and, and that was probably one of the driving factors behind going full-time in all honesty yeah. um when we initially had the first lockdown and rugby got put on hold, um, that was when I was effectively training as a full-time athlete. And like you said, my strength went up massively. I was pulling big numbers on the silver dollar. Um, we did the 400 kilo uh, deadlift for reps as well, and that went well. Um, and that was kind of the, the first thing in my mind was like, okay, actually, I probably could do with going full-time here. Uh, so seeing this did you have a chat with um, Stol uh, Luke Stoltman before? Because I know he made the similar choice as well. Did you just uh, I, will, I always, yeah, always chat to Lou, but most of our chats aren't really that useful. <laughs> We're mostly <laughs> <bad> shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, belly to bellies and all that shit, right? <laughs> belly, belly to belly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about how, how much like Tom's fucked up something in the last couple of days. <laughs> um, I forgot to do something or whatever. But uh, no, no, no. It was, uh, yeah, obviously seeing what uh, Luke's done as well. And he's taken a slightly different route in the fact that he's massively focused on the business, you know? So he... He and the, the Stockman's brand, they're doing a lot more on social media. They're doing more YouTubing and stuff. They're trying to make money that way. Um, whereas for me, I'm in a kind of different boat, I guess, really. I'm, I'm just focused about competing as long as I've got enough money to, to pay my mortgage and, and pay my bills and to fund my training for worlds. Then I, I, I'm happy, you know. That's all, yeah. that, all that really matters for me. Um, but yeah, the, the Stockman boys are doing really well at the moment. And yeah. Good, good mates of mine and uh yeah so british strong man's and it, it's amazing it's so it's it's just brilliant i can't say enough it's brilliant to see like it's really really great it's in a really, really strong, strong place i think i think we actually have eddie to thank for that uh um, yeah. eddie really moved the game on uh, especially in britain of what we thought was possible um and he has kind of paved the way really for more full-time athletes and and people making obviously a living out the sport and and, uh, you know, it's, it, we've got him to thank for a lot of that, the bigger crowds coming to shows, et cetera. You know, we're getting, you know, uh, 12,000 fans at Europe's Strongest Man now. It's uh, pretty impressive. It's so it's just, you know, for me, the next step for the sport is to get it live on TV uh, in some capacity, if we can. Um, is, is it possible? Because I know there's a big, you know, the forums on Facebook and all that, everyone is desperate for it, but then they're saying, well, no, because it's all about Christmas. Well, World's Strongest Man, I can't see being live um, just because it is filmed as a television show. But I could see the Giants live shows being on live TV. We literally just had one out in Bahrain, which was on ESPN. I watched it in the stream. I was yeah. going to say they live streamed that, that, that was live. online somewhere, didn't they? What was that? Sorry? They live streamed that because um, somebody sent me the link. They live streamed it, but it was on, on ESPN live in okay. America. Oh, wow. that's, the first, that's the first show that's been properly live. And obviously there were some issues a couple of bits that come from live live sport um but it showed it's possible to have a three-hour competition 
on TV. Uh, mm. And hopefully we can, we can move forward. I, I almost feel like you could probably show half the, the show on live TV over here. I don't think as many channels are going to give you a three-hour slot. Um, but you could, you could show an hour and a half slot um, maybe have like a quick update of the action so far or something but that would, that would be great if we get it on live TV then it obviously opens up the earning potential of sport you know, massively in terms of prize money huge. and uh, interest in the sport as well yeah that would be, be incredible man I mean we are a garage athlete show so we're all based around training at home and I think one of the reasons we also want to get you on is because you are a world ranked competing athlete training from home so, home, gym, home gym hero that's it home gym hero so we want to go can we go a bit into your home gym what have you got what are you proud of i would like to get into how and where you acquired all those um uh, ivanko chrome plates and uh, just just yeah. a bit bit of chat like that uh, just to, to wait home gym so uh yeah my home gym used to be a car barn two port car barn and we put the uh, the front on it with the doors um and we got it insulated inside and everything and then um the floor like i cannot stress enough guys if you're setting up a home gym you need to look after the floor and get a decent mats um that's probably the most important thing you know i spent about 1600 on the floor alone for the, the gym in terms of mats and uh, the lifting platform. what thickness did you go for 40 mil yeah 40 oh, mil geez, big ones. yeah yeah I, I think you have to unfortunately Dropping weights on stable mats is not great, even if it's a reinforced concrete base and you put plywood down as well. I think the stable mats won't absorb, one, the noise, and, and, and two, the impacts of repeated deadlifts. I think that the 40 mil uh, matting, if you're going straight into concrete, is probably the way forward. Um, you know, um, it's... Especially it's, with the deadlifts you're putting through, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Repeated places. But yeah, I've, most of my work goes around there. I've got a monolift in there. Um, which is a, a fancy squat rack that I, I got for cheap. Uh, so it's in there. doesn't get used too much at the moment. Usual squat rack. I've actually got one of the mirror fit racks, which is uh, quite narrow, which is a great space saver. Uh, it's not very deep. It's the kind of West Side style power rack. And yeah, the, M, the, the M3s are popping up a lot. Um, I think for what you pay for them, I think it might be the best rack in that range. I mean, I, it's holding up to what you're putting it through. I think so, yeah. I've tested it. <laughs> Way above yeah. 300, so it's all good. I mean, I I'm still laughing it. at that video with Gaz squatting you. I love that. Just like, <laughs> what is he going to do? <laughs> is that for moral support? Um, no moral support. Yeah, for, for those wondering, it's on his ambitious um, Instagram. I think it was at 340, was it? Uh, yeah, three, 345, yeah. 345 score. I mean, you, you crushed it, but just this is um, uh, uh, his, his fellow, his former colleague behind him spotting him. Uh, he's, you know, in great nick, but not exactly 150 kilo strong man. But it's just kind of like, What's going to happen here? Yeah, but, but more support. I, I like that, yeah. But that was great. Yeah. Then, you know, we're we talking for guys your sort of size. I'm guessing you're going to need a squat bar and things like that. So I've got a squat bar. Uh, I've got a, a Buddy Caps Texas squat bar. Um, I've got an AOA deadlift bar. Uh, I've got an Avanco weightlifting bar. I've got a Titex powerlifting bar, which is a very stiff IPF style bar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then a, a standard like Texas power bar, which if you're going to save money, I'd probably get a Texas power bar as one bar. It'll do yeah. you for a long, long time. Um, and then I've just commissioned, uh, it's getting built as we speak, uh, a 14 foot Hummer tire deadlift bar, uh, which will be epic. No way. Yeah, it's oh. obviously with a short classic. For people that yeah. know the short classic, one of the events we have is a, a Hummer tire deadlift. So it's like, it goes up to like over a thousand pounds, four massive tires, wheels off a Hummer. Uh, on a massively long bar, so I'm actually getting my own setup made for that. Um, how, do, how do you train with that? Because I think, what well, did you pull 490 without the, 490? Uh, yeah, we, without without the specific kit. So do you think maybe if you got the kit, you know, fly that's that sort of thing. Just get used to the pull a little bit more and and uh, specifically train it, you know. But trying to get the tires off a Hummer in the UK is actually proved a little bit different. Uh, so I, this is, I love this You're stuff. Like, we had a great, those. we had a great post the other day. It was either shared it done about like <laughs> this, this gyms, everyone's gyms keep popping up really nice and clean, super like great lighting, all this, you know, fancy machines. You put a strongman gym, it's literally like rocks and kegs and some log in the corner and oh, random stuff. stuff. And yeah. strongman are like, yeah, great gym. All, all broken, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've got, I've got that bar coming. Uh, it's being made. It's presenting some challenges in the fact that it's so long. Um, yeah. it's not going to be made out of one sort of straight piece of metal it's going to be a couple of bits that have to be kind of fabricated together um, 
And then, yeah, that's barbells. You know, I've got a couple of machines in there. Um, the Watson leg press. If anyone wants a leg press, I'd probably go for the, the, the Watson one because it's so small. Uh, it does fit in quite a small space. I've got it in there, uh, limited space. I've got a seated pull-down and cable row. Um, and these things aren't essential, guys, but when you're, when you're doing, like, heavy deadlifts and heavy squats, you don't want your assistance work to be also kind of barbell-based sometimes. You know, sometimes you just want to be able to sit down and do some leg presses <laughs> or do some seated rows and pull downs and stuff. So I've got them. And then I've got a bit of a, anyone who kind of follows my Instagram will know, I've got a bit of a dumbbell obsession. Yeah, um, the giant ones with your pressing. Well, yeah. yeah, well, I've got over 3,000 kilos of dumbbells in the barn. <laughs> um, dumb, dumbbells <laughs> ranging from two kilos up to 90. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the majority of those are Ivanko. Um, I just like the Vanco kit. It was the stuff I used to train on as a, a rugby player, and I think it's well put together for the it's dumbbell. Stuff, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got those, and then I've got some custom made dumbbells, the heavier ones. Um, and then yeah, bench, you know, and other little bits. Most of my strongman kit is at another gym uh, that I have, uh, which is a lock up, uh, which is where I've got my Atlas stones and. Um, you know, yokes and farmers walks and all that kind of stuff is, is done at a different location. But just my kind of day to day home gym stuff is, is all pretty basic. Um, but yeah, the, the Ivanko plates always kind of get draw people's eye because they're quite rare. Um, and I got those, <laughs> which is I was very fortunate. The, the great thing about obviously being in my position, working for a rugby club and, and doing strong man, you get to know people quite well. Uh, you get to know people in the business. So I actually got um, 400 kilos of Ivanko plates those chrome ones for 500 quid uh which if you what? Yeah, that's most people's reaction especially this is way before lockdown as well so this is you know good oh, no my, really worth now, my, but. my mind is blown right now like this is just i, <laughs> I mean i i had one opportunity uh, in my first powerlifting comp we had those Ivanko chromes and i just spent the whole time they're pretty cool because you know you, the american guys all like tons of records you know yeah. of the Ivanko's and they just look fucking great i mean i've got one set of weed uh, 10 kilo plates which are the same style and yeah, uh, yeah. they're great now on the whole thing but i think when you start getting into kit and then you realize a kit and the fact i don't think they make them anymore and they're just the beautiful the plates Look, if anyone's out there listening and they actually own a pair of the 50s the chrome ivanko 50s i will buy them off you uh it's just uh that's the only i haven't got the 50s and that's kind of the thing lacking um but yeah the rest the rest of them is a, a pretty cool Cool, uh, yeah. I, can't, I, I can't get over this 500 quid bit, mate. Like, I thought, like, <laughs> I've, I've, thought I've had some bargains, well, but that is just seeing as you unreal. pay what two pounds a kilo now for some raw iron barbell stamp plates, like second hand on Facebook. That's that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I do you know what? I don't know how I feel about the whole the price hike. And look, I, I see people getting really angry at the price of plates, but I mean, they're in demand, so you can't. You can't judge people for putting the price up, in all honesty. That's good business sense. You'd be thick as pig shit if you were selling at the prices before lockdown uh, because yeah. the value the value is is so high right now that they can't get the plates. You know, obviously, my sponsor, Mirafit, are, are having to try and get plates in and they're trying to get more and more plates delivered and they come in and as soon as they're in, they get sold. So, you know, think- there is a big demand for them and if people are, you know, demand pushes the price up on anything, it's the same as anything in life. I think what's changed is I was always, I, mean, I don't know if it sounds like you might have been similar to like obsessed with finding the bargain or, you know, you know, little things like this. Like I got a lot of my place for a pound a kilo, stuff like that. Whereas now that doesn't kind of exist. And you, you, I never used to buy new. Whereas now I do think, especially with companies like Mirafit, uh, Muscle Squad, Prime, all those kind of guys, they've kept prices okay. So you're actually you're probably actually buying new stuff for maybe less than people are trying to sell it second hand. Oh, that would so be my that would be my advice. If people are looking to buy, buy new because it's going to hold its value. So that's, yeah, that's it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. I, I never, if I see a good deal, I'll never turn it down to the point where that's why I've got a monolith in the gym and I really don't need one in there. <laughs> I got the monolith for seven hundred and fifty quid, um, and that's probably worth two and a half grand. Yeah, um, you know so it, it's it's a case of like uh, and especially like you said the the, the, the companies like mirafit watson these guys haven't upped their prices so i think it's 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 you know i think it's wise to buy new at the moment uh and just hold on to it but also give it six to eight months probably the start of 2022 i reckon the market is going to be flooded with people's unwanted home gym kit 
there's a lot of people who bought kit to train at home, but who enjoy the social aspects of a commercial gym. I reckon at the start of 2022, we'll see a lot of um, weights, plates, bars, maybe some racks go on on the uh, secondhand market. It'll probably drive the price down a little bit, I think. I think a lot of people that are scalping will be caught out at the back end of 2021. The people that are still buying up all the stock, because it's, it's artificially creating a shortage of stock. Yeah. Because as yeah. soon as stock comes in, everybody buys it and then tries to sell it on. I think those are the ones that are going to get caught out with it first when the demand starts to dry up and then the companies that are still operating start to get stock back in. Because as you said at the moment, people get stock in and it sells out straight away, which is yeah. keeping demand much higher than supply. It's only when everything kind of settles down and stuff can start kind of getting back into the country. Because obviously with all the problems that are going on with the ports and stuff at the moment, like... It's an absolute nightmare to get stock in. And I think that's what's keeping price high because people are wanting to recoup the value of their stuff like now. And it's going to take a while of stuff being sat on the second hand market and not selling for the prices to start coming down, like you said. I mean, that's the big worry in everyone's lips. You know, what about this boat stuck in the Suez Canal? How many plates is that holding up from China? You know? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the worry on every meathead's uh, mind at the moment is, yeah. There's no place totally, on yeah. China because a big boat stuck in the way. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. Uh, so just, just kind of like moving on. So did I see you, you're coaching Terry, Terry Hollands now? Yes, yeah. So uh, I worked with Terry in the build-up to uh, to Worlds. Uh, we, we've trained together for years and he kind of asked me just to look at his program and, and structure it how I would. Um, and we made some quite big changes for him as an older athlete and it, it really kind of paid off for Worlds this year. I think he was very unfortunate not to make the final. Uh, yeah, he, he was in great shape. Um, and he's had a, he had some personal issues at the back end of the year, uh, kind of still ongoing and stuff, but he's getting back to his training now. Um, so I'm, I'm letting him do his own thing. He's, he's got his own plan at the moment just to get back into to, to normal and then a couple of weeks before Worlds we'll, we'll start kind of like tr structuring his taper and stuff towards that and, and getting his events training back on track but yeah he's um, he's a good guy to work with Terry in all honesty he's uh, been around the block a long long time and he just needed a, a, a fresh set of eyes just to, mm. to treat him as an older athlete you know it, not try and do the same stuff he was doing when he was in his kind of 20s and early 30s Yes, I mean, how, how do you approach strong strongman programming? I mean, let's say we're working backwards from, uh, well, there's, there's so many different yeah. events to work on. There's so many different, you know, different kind of logs, different thickness of axles, all this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, how, uh, how do you personally approach strongman programming from someone just getting into it to someone in, say, off-season, no comps coming around, and then finally someone getting ready for a specific competition? Sure. So, um I tend to still go with your usual squat press and deadlift day and then an event session bolted on. I still do that because I think the static strength is so important. You know, if you are statically strong, you can get away of not being as technically good on a certain type of log. You know, strength does is the king, really. Um, so I, I tend to do that with most people. Um, the only caveat, really, to the change to that is if, uh, like, for example, my last kind of five weeks, this train block leading up to Worlds will pretty much all be events. Um, I won't really? be doing any kind of gym work. It will be focused towards the strong man because by that point, the events will be so heavy. Uh, I'll probably be training quite a few of them that I won't really have enough energy to train any other any other lifts, etc. And I don't really need to. By that point, I should be big enough and heavy enough that I won't need to do any kind of gym hypertrophy work. So it should just be focused on just the events. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I think a good solid split of kind of like squat, press. Or when I say press, I'm talking about Overhead press, not necessarily bench press. You bench? Uh, I'll incline. Yeah, I do incline uh, bench pressing. I don't do flat. I think it's just risk versus reward. It's not for me. Oh, God, uh, did you see that guy rip his pack off? I mean, yeah, R Ryan Cowley is... <laughs> he, he kind of split the... I mean, for, for me, that lift was never there. I don't know what <laughs> he was trying to do, and I don't, I don't really understand what happened, ground. but... Yeah, I mean, the backlash he's had off it is, has been huge, but then his Instagram following's like doubled, so maybe he got what he wanted out of it. That sounds really bad. You have a weird uh, way to get followers, though, right? Well, the people people <laughs> love people fucking up, so that's why people follow <laughs> stuff, you know? Um, but uh, I mean, by all reports, I've heard he's a, he's a very promising bodybuilder, so 
hopefully he does get that pack, he, well, the package. He managed to raise hopefully. the money yeah. to get his operation pretty quick, and that's normally the quicker you can get that reattached. Yeah. Normally, with modern day techniques and stuff, he may be able to come back. But yeah, it's one of those things like tearing your pet completely off the bone. Like how many people have come back and had a really, really good career after doing that? There isn't, there isn't many. But, you know, for me, and this is not obviously direct at, at, at Ryan in that case per se, um, but this is a, a reason why you don't deviate from plans. You know, if your plan is to be a bodybuilder, you have no place doing super maximal incline breath presses for one. You know, you have no yeah, place for that. Yeah. You can, you're staying in your lane, you know, and it's the same for me and Strongman. Like, I don't, I never dream of maxing out unless it's for competition or for money. I don't understand why people would take that risk, you know. I get, the number of times I see on, on Instagram, people going, oh, sorry to insert coach's name here. I felt really good today so I decided to go for a new personal best. But why? No one, I get all no one, the fucking no one, time. No one gives a shit. Like, literally no one gives a shit. Like, save yeah. it and do it in the competition when you're actually paid to do it or, or when you're competing for a trophy or when you get accolades. No, no one cares about your lift in the gym. Honest to God. Yeah, that's for just, the gram, for the Instagram, just, that gratification of those likes and those follows, isn't it? It's bizarre, yeah, isn't it? It is bizarre. I know guys make good good money out of it, but the vast majority don't. And you're just adding risk versus reward, you know. You just like, you know, like I said, geez, if I get injured in the gym, it's the worst thing that can happen. I should, well, one, I shouldn't be failing lifts in the gym. If my program goes to plan, I should never fail a lift in the gym. The whole build up, and then the other thing is if. Uh, if I'm getting injured in the gym, it means I'm, I'm losing money out competing. So, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs when people are just chasing those big lifts for Instagram likes and shares, isn't it, you know? Well, absolutely. It's, a, it, it's one of those things I like to say in practice I never do, but I know in, in theory, sorry, I, I don't do, but then in practice I get, we talked about this before, I mean, done about sort of the emotional connection to lifting. Yeah. And it's quite hard sometimes to, to step away from that. And this is where I think sometimes working with a coach can be really helpful. But I think there's something hugely empowering. And it seems to be every ridiculously strong guy I know seems to make their top sets almost they're like, what, that's your top set? Like, there's way more there. And it's like, it's like oh, you could be doing so much more. But it's like, no, they know what they're doing. Like, it's like we saw sort of Thor build up to his 500-ish deadlift. It always looked like he had tons more in him. I mean, how do you approach that with your training? Are you going off like RPE or have you got a specific percentage you're working for? I mean, how do you go? I'm, for I'm a percentage man. Um, I'm definitely a percentage guy. Um, I think RPE can be flawed depending on what an individual feels. Um, so I'll go off a percentage for me. And it's just usually I'm a, a linear progressive overload guy pulling up to the comp. Uh, um, my squat program actually is undulating, which means it kind of goes up and then down and up again and down. Mm. Um, but for me, just that progression for a deadlift, for example, is, is being kind of invaluable, really. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's all rep-based, you know? All, all my work is rep-based. Now, if I was a power lifter, I do see the value in doing heavy singles, you know? But not maximal singles. There should be a certain percentage of of the max you're looking to achieve on the day. Um, but you build strength through reps, you know, consistent consistent reps. I think people do forget that. Um, and if you look at the vast majority of successful programs, popular successful programs, you know, 531, um, look at uh, Juggernaut, uh, the Cube Method, all these kind of powerlifting, even Boris Shako's programs as well, you can translate them from Russian. Russian. The vast yeah, majority of the, the big bulk of those programs are all in the kind of 70 to 85% of 1RM. You know, it's, it's no coincidence that the bulk of the program is, is doing its work around there. Um, so as long as you're sticking within those parameters, I think you'll get stronger. Um, mm. Yes, of course, like I said, if you're building up to a powerlifting show, there is value in doing heavy singles and, and stringing those lifts together. But, but otherwise, I think if you're just looking to build strength, then, then stick to reps on the actual big lifts, you know? Like that's, that, yeah. that's the, every time I do an Instagram Q&A, the question I always get, what's the best assistant exercises for, and then name a main lift. I'm like, just do more deadlifting, you know? Mm. Like if I wanted to become a, if I wanted to be better at darts, I'm not going to go and throw javelin. You know, I'm just going to go and practice darts the whole time. And it's the same with, same with, uh, with lifting. If you want to get better at squatting, do more work on your main lift. 
that's fine. Your session could just all be squatting and that's still okay. You know, you don't have to be doing leg extensions and, and single leg step ups and all these different movements. You can just put the bulk of the time into improving your sport if your sport is, you know, squatting, benching and deadlifting. Yeah, so it's, if you could just sort of go over the differences between powerlifting and strong enough, is there no squatting? It, it does appear at Worlds quite frequently, but for most competitions, it's, and I've never, I've done one competition with a squat in it. It seems more of like an assistance lift, but you ask any strong man what they're obsessed about, it's the deadlift. So, I mean, I think, is it 440s your best? Yeah, in competitions, 440s. I did that in um, 2019. So yeah. I'm just, I'm just waiting for a deadlift comp. Um, so I'm good, I'm good for over a thousand at the moment. So it's just awesome. waiting for the comp to do it, really. Yeah. Um, so I mean, like, how do you approach? How do you approach when you did that 440? Yeah, I mean, this, it'd be cool to talk about. How do, how do you approach when you did that 440? What's the training leading up to that? You know, we mm. talked about not failing, getting the reps in. I mean, did you sort of work backwards from 12 weeks, have all your numbers that you would wanted to go and then move forward? How did you adjust when, say, things didn't feel good on the day or injuries or whatnot? Yeah, so my, my program uh, for that 440, the 440 was all, always in my mind. That's what I worked backwards off. And it was a 10-week program, uh, which will be commercially available soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get more to that. I love it. <laughs> but, Copy um, down. There's a 10-week yeah, a a program uh, that I ran there, which started with high reps, we dropped down and as the weights got heavier, then I alternated between speed reps and, and heavy reps. It's actually a program I, I spoke to Terry about and I spoke to Eddie back in the day. About he was, how. yeah, Ed, Eddie came and did a chat with him about the um, week. It was almost like sort of um, West Side style, almost like one week heavy, one week light. One week heavy, one week light. And um, it, you're still pulling fast on those days. But yeah. you know, obviously there's another one I spoke Intent. to, and, Andy Bolton as well about yes. it. And big fan of speed pulls. Um, and yeah, so that's the program I employed. It was supposed to be a 10 week program. And unfortunately, World's Strongest Man decided to get moved into about two weeks before uh, the deadlift champ. So I had to kind of deal with that a little bit, but it still worked out. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just deal with Worlds, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I had, had World's Strongest Man, and then I was on holiday the week after, and I came back and did the deadlift champ. So I was literally in a, oh, in a, gym, a CrossFit gym in Spain doing speed pulls with like 280, where all these like little ch <laughs> tiny. Tiny Spanish guys are like looking at me like, what the hell is this massive with bumpers I bet as well. doing, you know? <laughs> with bumper pulls pale, as well. pale, sunburnt, sweaty mess pulling deadlifts in their in their CrossFit gym. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, you know, it was it was a case of just taper towards that. I think the last the last session I did uh on that, I pulled um I pulled three singles at four hundred as my last heavy session, and then um yeah, three singles at 400, and then uh, which was around 90%, obviously, of what I was going for. And then I did my speed week, which was at uh, 275, so around 55%, 60% uh, yeah. for my eight sets of two on the speed pools. And that was that was me. And then going into the competition, I just made sure I was fresh and, and ready to pull. My last session was around, last day of the session was around 10 days out from competition. Um, yeah, so, I mean, typically speaking with... Uh, it seems to be quite common as well with the, you guys and top level strongman. The bigger, heavier, stronger you, you guys are, it seems to be you have to start peaking, temp, tapering down quite far out, which might throw, say, a smaller guy out quite a lot before competition. But it seems you guys need, you really need to start tapering back. And if you don't time it right, then fuck, you, you could all go to shit on the Yeah, day. oh, definitely. Yeah. When we, we, when we taper, obviously, I've done it both ways. And actually, some of the stuff I found is just take the week off. I found great, felt great just taking a week off training uh, and not doing anything. Um, that's my, my thing with a taper. I think where a lot of people people kind of mess up a taper and a deload, and I don't think they're the same. And whereas a deload, obviously, you're looking to re reduce load uh, and you still kind of lift with some volume. Uh, with a taper, you actually want to drop the volume out and keep the intensity relatively high. So I'll still be, like I said, the most speed. Singles of 400. Exactly, yeah. singles of 400. And, I was hardly doing any assistance work on that at that point, and I will be in Worlds. Like I said, it's exactly the same for my plan for Worlds. You know, I'll be moving to all those events. I've dropped out anything else that is unnecessary and high in volume. Uh, it's just high intensity work um, yeah. because volume is the stuff that adds unnecessary fatigue. You know, yes. the, the big maximal lifts is going to give us our our kind of big stimulus, our novel stimulus that then drives the adaptation. But the volume stuff is just the people going and just to get a pump or whatever. 
it's just adding needless fatigue that's not giving you any benefit. Um, yes. Slow your recovery down. So that's why I'll tend to drop out um, early uh, as part of my taper. Is that something you kind of experimented with yourself? Because I'm going through a big uh, shift in my chair. I've done a bit of bodybuilding phase. It was brilliant, whereas I've got to go back into heavier stuff now. And I've been, you know, really up a lot on, you know, almost like I think the term is, uh, what's his name? Guy down in Southampton, I've got his name, uh, Tom, if his name escapes me, but describes it as um, uh, like junk volume, where it's almost like you're doing volume for volume's sake. I mean, is this something with, in your programs do you build and say, is it like four sets of five, I know 75%, or do you have a sort of, no mark or you'd be like you know what if it starts to get quite grindy or doesn't feel right just just cut it or would you rather kind of hold your you guys and girls like back and they always feel like they can do a bit more yeah well i mean so just this is just obviously this is not talking about rugby players this is talking about strong men and my training i don't have any junk volume so every single every single set i do is intense you know mm. even if the the weight is lower on the bar. If I'm doing a back off set with pause squats, I'm still trying to move as quickly as possible out of the hole. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's the same if I'm doing volume work. As volume work, I'll still use... What's volume for a strong man? Like three sets of six? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's not even sets of. It's working up to that top set. So I work, I'm always working to a top set. So for example, um, what was it? Last night on the leg press, worked up to, um, which is what I was using as my kind of hyper, hypertrophy driver on that. Um, I, I worked up to like five... 520 uh, and got 14 reps, which is one more rep than I did last week. You know, but it was yes. just that one maximal set. So I warmed up, saved everything for that top set, and then just went like hard as fuck at it, you know, mm. and just um, elicited like a, basically what I'm saying, like a novel, a new novel stimulus for that muscle that it hasn't it's never dealt with before. More weight for more reps or more weight for the same reps, and then up it that way. Uh, I do that with all my exercises. So the same for in kind bench presses. You know, for double presses, I'll probably just take maybe one or two warm-up sets and then go on to that, that top set to failure. Basically. Yeah, so you kind of like, um, uh, it also says like, you know, I've got to get an echoes of kind of Dorian Yates style training. That Dorian Yates really... stuff, mate, yeah. Big, big, big fan. I was a big fan of Dorian. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, like the, the human body does not want to change. You have to force it to change. And, and in order to change, you know, you can, oh, yes, you can overload it with volume, but for me, I think mechanical, mechanical resistance and, 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 and that tension on the muscle, maximal, maximal tension on the muscle is going to be what's going to cause larger amounts of hypertrophy, in my opinion. Uh, and it limits the time you're in the gym. Who wants to be there doing like five sets of 10 on every exercise and be in the gym for two hours where you can get it done in 45 minutes and go home and eat is where you're really going to grow. So mm. I'm just big on getting big as big as hell stimulus go home recover get that adaptation off the back of it yeah it's obviously working well for you <laughs> yeah yeah man um yeah it's, it's, uh, when, when we talk about these these high intensity sets are we talking about you know 10 out of 10 you know gun to your head you've got to get this done or is it kind of you're giving it that absolute maximum intent going as hell hell for leather but you're still kind of stopping like two reps short or something no i'll go i'll go close to failure if i've got a spotter i'll go beyond failure mm -hmm. on on those sets um if i haven't i might have half a rep or one rep in the tank but it's it is to to failure um it's it, but the thing i should say here is it's where form is standardized so i'm always lifting with the same form i'm not then Cheap, getting cheat reps out. You know, I don't count those kind of cheat reps if like, my hips come up off the bench or if I have to like, you know, whatever, like, yeah, I agree. like use a bit of more body English to move a, you, bit of a Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't <laughs> count that. So it's all about that standardized form, that standardized tempo and then progressing that way. Um, but yeah, it is, it is to failure um, and sometimes beyond failure, maybe for one or two of the exercises, they'll go beyond failure where I can, whether it's possible to do a drop set with dumbbells or from a gym that's using kind of like hammer strength machines, using force reps that way, or some negatives or anything like that. Oh yeah, so yeah, um, yeah last post I think in a gym using the uh, was it rugby hypertrophy or something you found in some, uh, oh, some fun, you know the bodybuilding shots, you know maybe get a calf raise in there. With that's them. it, get some calf raise. Did my posing afterwards about seventy yeah. weeks out from stage. <laughs> seventy, very good man. So I mean, the last bit for me, I mean, let's think about you know what is going through your mind. 
before these max sets because we're not talking like we're talking like 90 kilo dumbbells here 300 plus deadlifts like what is going through your head how long does it take you to get mentally prepared for that switched on and focused because it can go shit can go south very quickly with the kind of weights you're lifting and the fact that you're doing most of this on your own at home like what's you know where are you going to before you get these big lifts out um, I tend to focus, I, I definitely do visualize the lift beforehand. This is even before I'm on the platform, I'm sitting there, the bar's loaded, I'm just kind of waiting and I'm, I'm visualizing what the lift's going to look like in my mind, what it feels like as well. Uh, I use a lot of kind of like imagery that way. Um, then once I get to the, once I get behind the bar, I've got my set routine that's always the same, whether it's a deadlift, you know, it, it's you know set routine. You'll always see me do exactly the same thing on my setups. It's you know, strap onto this hand, strap onto this hand, walk my feet in, uh, pull on the bar once, and then I'm going. Uh, and I guess I'm just kind of really focusing on, all I'm really focusing on is how many reps I need to achieve for that set. That's it. You know, nothing else is in my mind. Um, when it comes to competition, it's a little bit different, you know. Most of the time in competition, I'm trying to prove people wrong, if that sense, because I'm usually the underdog of these competitions just because there are more well-known guys who do more work on social media and stuff than me. And people like to chat shit and say they're going to beat me. And then in my head, I'm just like, fuck you guys, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove you wrong, you know? Uh, and even yeah, if I'm yeah. not, even if I'm not, people aren't saying that, I'll try to create that in my brain. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're using that negative to turn into a huge positive. I mean, that's for what some I mean. people, it might break them. It might make them feel well anxious and shit. But it seems for you, that kind of fuck you, I'm going to do this is really helps you drive it helps drive you like, yeah. the, the worst the worst thing can happen for me is if someone thinks i'm a favorite you know i have to then convince myself that i'm not well you're getting close to it now with all these wins mate yeah that's, that's <laughs> the problem i have to get more creative but luckily there's always there's always people out there who chat shit you know so it's fine chat shit will get banged in it, yeah. there's, there's, it, yeah. there's, there's always so trolls really? no matter how successful you are there's <laughs> oh, always brilliant. trolls brilliant mate. bring it on you know yeah, that's just people that troll struggle i just i don't i don't get it like <laughs> the whole troll culture is not for me but, but i don't understand but i mean i mean it was just kind of we'll start out bringing it in so i mean like what what are you i know you're full time now but i mean what are you kind of doing on i know you do quite a lot of coaching i know you've got some programs coming out yeah know? so um i've got some of my programs available uh, via the silverback website which you can actually find that on like silverback gymwear uh dot com and it's uh you'll get a link sorted out yeah there's a little athlete you know it's called a uh, strength club and there's some of my programs on there uh people can buy those and they're all um there's a deadlift one a squat one and then there's one which would be perfect for a lot of your listeners which is like called bulking with barbells which is actually uh, a limited equipment program focused on kind of building muscle uh based around barbell work and squat squat you know bench and deadlift and rows and stuff and anything basically you can use a home gym set up um but yeah, that, that most of those programs are all based off percentages. So they, they work to the individual lifter, which is great. Because uh, I get a lot of people asking me for online coaching and, and my time's very valuable. So I only actually take on a couple of athletes. So this kind of gives people an opportunity if they want to follow my programs, they can kind of do it in their own time and they've got the program available to them. So yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that'd be um, it's a great option for a lot of people that maybe can't go for various reasons or financially down the route of one-to-one on my coaching but they can get a great insight into some of what you can provide for them from these programs exactly exactly you know and it's it's not a, it's not an ebook where you have to do everything it's it's a it's a program where you put in your numbers and then it calculates all your numbers for you so it's quite it's idiot proof i'd say it's strongman proof uh, <laughs> we're, not, we're not the smartest bunch out there you know so you're pretty like, fucking not, man. <laughs> sorry i got me yeah no kind of in a, in a, in a big ex, a big bit in an explosive uh, eight t-shirt yeah. Well, sorry, Silverback, Silverback. Silverback, no, yeah, no, yeah. 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 yeah, we did talk about the Silverback, but uh, yeah, the old, um, uh, there's a few memes like Novice Strongman Starter Pack. Yeah, I've had a bit of fun with that over the years. Yeah. Yeah, cool, man. But um, yeah, just thank you so much for getting up your time today, man. It was really a really pleasure talking to you. I'm glad we um, finally caught up and it was, yeah, just wonderful to have Britain's Strongest Man on the uh, podcast. Pleasure, mate. It's good, good chat to you. I think it's a, it's a nice podcast, great idea to chat about people who train at home and stuff. It's it's brilliant. So, yes, yeah, thank you for having me. Anytime, mate. So, uh, just before find you, they said, you said you've got Instagram. Uh, is that the best place to kind of see your content? Or is there, a, and obviously there's a sil- uh, Silverback website, so I'll grab all those links. But is there anywhere else that they can go to see more of you? 
Yeah, so obviously Instagram it's at Adam Bishop Strongman, uh, and then Facebook as well. As you just search for Sir Adam Bishop, um, it will come up. That's my athletes page, um, Adam Bishop SC, I think it is. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I do most of my work on Instagram and stuff, so um, yeah, keep an eye out on that. For they do some great Q and A's. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's usually the same see. questions, but <laughs> <laughs> why why do you deadlift so narrow? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. Well, we, we should get like who's going to win out of Eddie and four. Uh, oh, fuck chat, yeah, actually, it's a fair play to you guys. I brought it up at the end, but the first podcast I've had where people haven't talked about Eddie and Thor, which is pretty impressive. So, yeah, uh, I think you know, it's like I, I see what they're doing for the sport, it's great, you know, lovely, but just um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, for, for me personally, I wanted to get you on probably obviously because of the uh, rugby connection, but sure. I think the way you do your strongman is similar to the way I've maybe tried to approach it in terms of being trying to be great at everything i mean I'm, tr- I'm trying you know i'm not a bit, you know not one or this and i think when you do your wins it's kind of you pick up points consistently through various different things not necessarily being this you know i say monster deadlift we've got still 440 kilos but not necessarily being great at just one thing but kind of your your wins come yeah. off the back of lots of um, points adding all up that's and the name maybe of the game. other people yeah. the name of the game you've got to be you know, strongest man across the board, not just on one lift. So it's the uh, it's what we're kind of striving for, being the best at everything. Absolutely, man. Well, best of luck for 2021. I know you've got your world's invite, so we're rooting for you and I wish you all the best. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Great chance to you today. Anytime. Thanks again, Adam. You take care. No problem. Bye. Bye.